Wir sind tatsächlich fast am Ende angekommen. Wir hatten ja vorhin eine spannende Keynote von Herrn Döpfner und mit ihm schließen wir auch gleich nochmal ab. Wir haben vorher so ein bisschen einen Ausblick gegeben, was uns heute erwartet und jetzt wird Herr Döpfner mit einem spannenden Gast, den Sie gleich sehen werden, einen Ausblick auf die nächsten sieben Jahre, auf die Zukunft geben. Insofern würde ich sagen, Film ab. Hello, it's my great pleasure to welcome and talk to Lucy Kung. She is, and I have to read it because it's really a long title, she is the Google Digital News Senior Research Fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. And on top of that, she is a non-executive board member uh, at the NZZ Neue Zürcher Zeitung in Zurich. And above all, uh, fascinating expert on media innovation and digital transformation. And that is, of course, the main topic that is in the mind of every publisher here in the room and all around the world. Uh, lots of changes in our industry. It's lovely to be here. It's a great, a great honor to, to be uh, to talk to this community and to talk to you. Could you share with us your vision of a potential media product and media landscape of the future? How is it going to look like in, let's say, seven years uh, will we still have print how will digital newspapers digital news offerings look like could you share some radical thoughts with us that's that's really tough um i think i think print classical newspapers and magazines will probably migrate the way of opera beautiful products kind of kind of uh, somehow status products i think in terms of of um content I think we're ending up in a very kind of, um, I think the vertical concept, I think what we're going to end up with is a group of organizations who own specific areas of content, right? So the, there will be news organizations who are, are the, the, uh, own a particular area of content. And I think the challenge is going to be actually for organizations to identify which areas do they really have to own and which do they which which areas can they kind of let go which areas are commoditized which areas can they add value but i think it, i think it's really really difficult i mean i think the concern i have that we're seeing in the current environment is the leader group is pulling ahead so fast it's getting really impossible for the kind of also runs to catch up and and they they're kind of kicking off a jeff bezos flywheel the whole organization is pulling to strengthen the core product increase the number of subscribers Do you have a personal role model, a media company or a brand uh, uh, that is doing this particularly well, where you say that is in a way the, the uh, kind of cutting edge uh, media product these days? Oh, really good question. I mean, every, every success is completely context dependent, so it's kind of never a recipe. But I think in terms of transformation, the New York Times is clearly very impressive. And I think if you analyze what happened to the New York Times, that's kind of 15 years of painful decisions and difficult shifts. It, it didn't come easily. They, they made some missteps as well. I think Axios is very interesting in terms of their positioning, in terms of this I mean, in some ways, they feel to me like the successor to The Economist, it, you know, incredibly, um, incredibly expert, very easy to digest, painless to digest, very concise content. Um, I'm curious where they expand to from here, though. I mean, clearly, they're going to broadcast with HBO. So I think it's a kind of, um, uh, I guess those are the two organizations I'm most interested in. I'm, I'm interested in the simplicity and the technological amazingness of, of the Netflix concept. But I mean, I think there's only elements of that we can we can yeah. steal from the industry. You, you mentioned the New York Times, and uh, that brings us to another element of uh, change and debate about change in the media industry. Uh, one of the success factors of the New York Times uh, is uh, uh, as a basis for the development to get to five million subscriptions, uh, that they are more and more perceived as a anti-Trump, anti-government platform. And almost nobody denies that there is a pretty clear bias and that that bias is a success factor because the audience, the consumer, want it that way. Uh, and that also led to an interesting um, decision when the head of the editorial pages of the New York Times published this famous piece 
on the Trump interventions after Black Lives Matter demonstrations uh, that uh, he basically had to leave uh, because this piece that was defending Trump's initiative was so much against the consensus of the readership that he was basically unacceptable for the audience. And then this debate moved to a second step where more and more particularly young journalists, uh, millennials, said in the US but also here in Europe, Perhaps the bigger purpose of journalism is not to strive for objectivity or neutrality or audiato et alte rapaz, so here listen to the other side and have a certain diversity of views and facts. It is more uh, almost activism for a good cause. And also in Germany that debate has continued uh, with a famous uh, editorial in Der Spiegel, end of neutrality, journalism shouldn't be neutral or shouldn't even try to be neutral, uh, it should be biased for a good cause. How do you see that? I mean, that is quite, if that is also a generational phen phenomenon, that would be a fundamental game changer for the whole media industry. Yeah, I think it's incredibly dangerous. I think it's incredibly dangerous. I mean, the US society and its media has become incredibly polarized. You see that kind of CNN to an extent has got sucked into that as well. I mean, that way ratings lie that way all kinds of, you know, uh, financial security lies if you get sucked into a very partisan line. I think I'd probably dispute that the New York is, New York Times is so tightly in that line as, as perhaps you feel it is. But I think, I think we do have a real problem and it's actually a problem that's kicking up everywhere. I mean, we saw it in this summer, we saw kind of really nasty incidents at the Wall Street Journal, we saw it at the Washington Post. The BBC has had three. Each time it's made the wrong decision, it's done a U-turn on the decision and it's managed to completely alienate the newsroom as it, does, as it did. So I think what we're seeing there is a really complex issue. I mean, clearly opinion articles that were so long part of our publications, their context has changed enormously. And I think uh, to use that fantastic German word, we need a huge auseinandersetzung with how we handle that issue. My, my sense is they have to be there. That's part of the duty of a responsible publication to, to display other views. But I think we have to make the fact that those are external contributions idiotly proof obvious. I think at the moment it's it's clear to those inside the building, yes, that's that's an external commentator and that's from one of us. But I think for readers, especially when, when you get into the kind of digital environment, Facebook, whatever, all of that signaling disappears. They just they just get completely confused about what your brand stands for. So we're seeing all kinds of careers being really damaged. We're seeing news brands being diluted. So I think my sense is it would be a tragedy if that happens in Europe. We need to, we need to act against it. We need to be very careful. We need to keep a variety of opinions, but we need to make it visibly, completely clear what's external and what's internal. And would your, would your prediction be that this is then only a kind of short debate with a good outcome because we will keep that model that we should at least strive for pluralism and debate? Or do you think that it could turn out to be a generational issue and that the young, younger generation simply has a different understanding of journalism and with that a different expectation which would then lead to a fundamental change? What is your outlook here? I, I kind of, I, I fear it's going to go the way you're describing it. I think there is a big intergenerational difference here. I mean, one of the things that's been coming out in my current research, which were things I wasn't looking for, they weren't on the original kind of research plan. One of the huge shifts inside organizations is actually the impact of generations Y and Z, millennials and generation Z. And they do think in a profoundly different way and they're looking for profoundly different types of organizations and and as a group they are they care so deeply about some things that their personal values and their uh, really spill into the into their workplaces so i think it's extremely it's going to be really challenging i think for organizations to um navigate this way forward if they're going to keep those newsrooms motivated and involved. I mean, that was really the problem we saw at the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, right? Um, you had a very young newsroom and a somewhat kind of conservative news agenda, and there was a, there was a massive yeah. clash. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really would like to find a kind of optimistic uh, uh, note for our conclusion, but I have to mention before we do that, 
the role of the platforms. And I would be curious if that makes you more optimistic with regard to the future of journalism, publishers, media brands and its credibility, or more pessimistic if you look to certain developments of fake news distributed via Facebook and other platforms, if you look to the role that Google plays in basically taking away elements and fundamentals of the business model of, of publishers, and also with this huge concentration that uh, simply very few platforms, two, three, basically decide what a couple of billion uh, users uh, read uh, and see around the world? Well, I think structurally, it's there's a massive um, strategic uh, imbalance there, right? I mean, small, medium-sized organizations are fighting against the largest organizations the planet have ever seen. I mean, it's so imbalanced. There's a massive asymmetry there. And I think it's a, it's a really complicated codependence also because the media industry cannot afford not to engage with the platforms. They're the bridges to growth, the bridges to new audiences. Um, but at the same time, those platforms, as you said, have decimated revenues and, and have, you know, really threatened the survival. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, I hate to end on a negative note, but I think it's, it's a really, really difficult situation. I think also I'm very worried about the kind of the way a lot of smaller organizations are so dependent actually for innovation now on Google and Facebook through their various initiatives. I think it's... But if I think we it's compare big, big global media companies uh, with the super big supranational uh, platforms, then they are all small. Only the platforms are big. On the other hand, you have on another level, you have regional newspaper publishers, you have local newspaper publishers, you have very small special interest publishers. So you have lots of very small media organizations, family businesses. And there is a kind of uh, tendency to think that the digitization is only an opportunity for the big ones. Only they can survive in the digital world. Do you agree? Or could it be that actually the opposite is true? The more focused you are, the smaller you are, the clearer you define your USB, the better you can digitize. What is your take on that? If, if, if one looks at Scandinavia, Norway in particular, they're regional newspapers, very digital ones doing really well, small ones. So I think I think it's not it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I think and actually structurally, if you look at it, the big advantage they have is they can get really, really close to their readers. They can really add value to their readers' lives. So I think clearly the route to growth to sustainability lies in getting very, very close to those communities. Um, I also was I'm really interested in um, kind of initiatives like Ken Doctor's new new startup, local news startup in, in San Jose, Tortoise in the UK, where they've also tried to find scale by getting kind of philanthropists, public service organizations to buy subscriptions at scale for local news organizations. So I think, yes, scale and growth is going to be really, really hard. I think they have to be really smart about that. But actually, if we look to Scandinavia, we see it can work. But the route to that is actually getting really, really close to audiences. But I mean, even if you look at events, that's the one sector of the media where events can still function, actually. But you see, we managed to end on an optimistic note where we, by the way, totally agree. I fully share that. I think that you can be super successful. Actually, you can do better if you are a small, local, regional or special interest media organization. If you have and here the circle is closing also of your arguments if your customer focus is clear. And if you are closer to your customers than a big organization, you have a competitive advantage. And I think with that, uh, there is an opportunity for everybody and we should definitely focus, I think, on the opportunities that this change is providing. Uh, I thank you very much for uh, spending uh, time with us here today. Uh, and it was really a pleasure talking to you. All the best. Thanks very much. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure on my side as well.